Well, welcome. Thank you all for coming. Uh, we are at the 40th anniversary of Watergate, which of course is a three-year affair. Uh, soon, which will be followed by three years of the 45th anniversary of Watergate. So there's always a good time to commemorate Watergate. Usually these commemorations include you know, a lot of the old Nixon administration officials like John Dean and uh, the prosecutors and the journalists who covered it. And so we thought it might be interesting to do something different and to have a panel of some of the younger scholars, and by younger, I, I define that as anyone my age or younger. Um, so I to include myself, uh, which is getting harder and harder to do. But, uh, some of the younger scholars who've been writing about Watergate and the Watergate period and the political and cultural history of that period uh, and, and see 40 years on if there uh, are some new uh, perspectives to be shared and uh, new discussions to be had that uh, maybe haven't surfaced in earlier uh, commemorations. Uh, so uh, I actually have here on my phone everybody's uh, IDs. Uh, I'm David Greenberg myself. I'm an associate professor of history and also of journalism and media studies at Rutgers University. Um, and I'm chairing and also giving a few comments. Um, to my right is Beverly Gage, who's a professor of history at Yale, who's currently writing a biography of former FBI director and uh, Nixon friend and antagonist J. Edgar Hoover. Uh, next is Ken Hughes, who is a researcher with the University of Virginia's Miller Center, and he studies uh, Nixon's secretly recorded White House tapes, uh, as well as Lyndon Johnson's tapes. And his research focuses on the politics of the Vietnam War. Uh, next is Kate Scott, who is an assistant historian in the U.S. Senate Historical Office, and the author of the recently published Reigning in the State, Civil Society and Congress in the Vietnam and Watergate era, which uh, I commend to you all. It's an excellent book. Uh, and Mark Nevin is an assistant professor of history at Ohio University, Lancaster. He is currently working on a book manuscript tentatively titled The Nixon Presidency and the Rise of Public Opinion Polling in American Politics. So I hope we'll all have some new thoughts and perspectives on Nixon and Watergate uh, to share with you today. Uh, Beth, you want to start? Sure. Thanks, David. Um, and thanks to all of you who are here. I know we're in a very big room, so there are actually a lot of people here, which are just all sort of spread out. Um, this is a round table, so we were all charged with really just offering a few introductory thoughts and then hopefully having um, quite a lot of back and forth between ourselves up here and, uh, and, and with all of you. Um, so toward that end, I thought I'd offer a few general thoughts about the state of thinking about Watergate at this point, 40 years out, and also um, a few more specific uh, aspects of Watergate that have come to interest me as I've been writing about J. Edgar Hoover. So I think there's something very sort of perplexing or paradoxical perhaps going on with Watergate at the moment. So on the one hand, Historians uh, in recent years have really discovered the 70s. Um, and we've seen a huge rash of books coming out uh, on the 1970s. The 1970s have suddenly become history, and the 1970s have become something much more important than the decade between the very interesting 1960s and the very interesting 1980s. And so the 1970s are hot right now. I realized at some point that all of the, uh, this is no longer true, but uh, a few months ago, it was true that all of the dissertation committees that I was sitting on of graduate students were writing essays, dissertations about the 1970s. Um, so the 1970s is this huge field of scholarship. There's lots of interesting stuff being done um, on the one hand. On the other hand, Watergate, which I think many people who lived through the 1970s would say was one of the kind of seminal political cataclysms of the decade, one of uh, certainly the events that defines the 1970s, I think in this new literature really has been receding in importance and in a study. Um, and so I think to some degree that's quite a natural turn of events, which is to say that often the first drafts of history are uh, drafts of the large political events in any decade, and as we begin to step away from them and get a little more perspective, uh, the high politics tends to recede a little bit. We can see other trends and other movements and other aspects of history that have had an impact. Uh, 
Um, but I would like to see um, even more work being done on Watergate. So I'm hoping that we can think about ways that we might actually take Watergate and the very specific history that is Watergate and be integrated um, a little better into this broader historiography that's emerging about the 1970s. Um, as David noted, one of the things that I really uh, love about being up here on this panel is that uh, I think none of us sitting up here really have any living memory of Watergate. Uh, and so at the 40th anniversary, that means we're really just crossing over into that moment in which um, it really is history. I myself here will reveal my age. Uh, but uh, I was born in July of 1972, so a month after the Watergate burglary. Uh, and so I do think that this generation of historians are the first people uh, to be looking at Watergate without really having had that visceral experience of watching it unfold um, and having uh, that generational experience. Um, so I think there are a few things, as I said, that uh, have emerged as particularly interesting to me um, as a scholar, uh, not really of the 1970s, but uh, of the FBI and of uh, intelligence. Um, and so I want to talk about those a little bit. Um, so one thing I think we have to think about when we talk about Watergate at this point as a historical phenomenon is to ask what it is that we're talking about when we talk about Watergate. And um, as David noted, there is a pretty traditional um, and quite drawn out definition of Watergate, which is that it begins with the burglary in June of 1972 and it ends with Nixon's resignation in August of 1974. And I actually think that there's quite a lot of room now, 40 years out, to, uh, to do new research about the details of that story, but even to retell that story itself uh, for a new generation, again, um, a new generation of readers, of historians, um, and particularly of students who um, did not live through it, have no real memory of it, and for whom the idea that uh, the country was absolutely gripped by this series of fairly tedious congressional hearings is something that we now actually need to sort of explain and translate. So that's sort of the first definition, but I actually think it would be um, equally interesting to talk about Watergate um, with this 40-year perspective, not only as that series of events, but as part of a really very large uh, rethinking of the structures of American government that begins in the late 1960s, um, really with the examination, even the mid-1960s, with the examination of uh, and reform of the congressional committee structures, of uh, the primary system, and then extends into the post-Watergate period um, with, uh, in particular, in my own scholarship, in my own areas of interest, um, the intelligence reforms of the late 1970s. And I think we have an idea of the 1970s and a kind of standard narrative of the 1970s as being an era of retreat from politics, and in certain ways uh, that's true when you compare it to uh, certain moments in the 1960s, but I actually think it's much more interesting to think about the 1970s as a period of very intense political clashes, but even more importantly, really intense moments of political reform that transform the structures of national government in a whole lot of ways. Um, so the last thing that I will just throw out um, is, is particular to um, that last area that I was discussing, which is uh, the rise of the church committee and of the intelligence reforms that come uh, in many ways out of Watergate, out of the uh, sort of investigative impulses of Watergate. And I'll just end with uh, a couple of quick observations along that front. Maybe we can expand on that as well. So um, one is the proposition that the death of J. Edgar Hoover in May of 1972, so Hoover dies in May of 1972, the Watergate burglary is in June of 1972. Um, he is one of the uh, most underestimated and most important parts of the story of why it is the Watergate plays out as it does. Uh, the internal politics of the FBI in the mid-1970s, I think, are really critical to the Watergate story, and we can talk more about those. I think a little more broadly, that story suggests that we want to think a little more seriously about conflicts within the executive branch uh, during the Watergate period. I think it's often narrated as a battle between the president and Congress or between uh, kind of social movements critical of Nixon on the outside, uh, pressure on the White House uh, from beyond, but I think there are a lot of really interesting uh, conflicts within the executive branch itself. Um, and the last thing that I will just throw out as food for thought um, is the idea uh, that many of the reforms that I would say emerged in the 1970s out of Watergate, out of these intelligence uh, hearings, are now being uh, rewritten um, and uh, in many ways unwritten, and so we might want to think about some of the connections between the past.
That's fantastic. Thank you, Ben. Ken? Thank you, David. Thank you, Beverly, for thinking that I am too young to remember Watergate. <laughs> <laughs> um, and in, in response to your expressed desire, I will now retell the story of Watergate in less than 10 minutes. And it turned out everything is different from what you thought. Um, I spent the last 17 years studying mostly Nixon's secretly recorded White House tapes, also some of Kennedy's and Johnson's. And on all 2,636 hours of Nixon tapes that the federal government has declassified so far, you can only hear the president order one burglary. And it's not Watergate. Mitch Richard Nixon ordered his aides to break into the Brookings Institution, a think tank less than a mile from here off DuPont Circle and to steal uh, a copy of a report on the 1968 bombing halt that he believed was there. This is just weird. <laughs> just as weird is the, Nixon, is the reason that Nixon gives his aides for doing this. He says he wants the report so that he can blackmail former President Lyndon Johnson, whom he says called the bombing halt less than a week before the 1968 election, in order to elect Hubert Humphrey as vice president and the Democratic presidential nominee president. Um, this raises three questions. Um, what, what evidence is there that LBJ did that? To what, what would Nixon blackmail a retired politician living out his final days in Texas to do? <laughs> and third, how could it possibly be worth the risk involved in committing a felony and an impeachable offense? Um, at the time, uh, well, first off, his charge that, that Lyndon Johnson called the, called the bombing halt for Hubert Humphrey is demonstrably false. And Catherine Forsman, in her great little book on, um, her great book on Anna Chenault, proved that it was false by pointing out that LBJ had started the bombing halt negotiations, set three conditions for halting the bombing, said, I'll only do it. Catherine Roy respects the DMC. Uh, sits down and talks with the South Vietnamese in Paris, and they try to let them uh, break the end of life as well, and uh, stopped doing terrorist attacks, uh, shelling attacks on South Vietnamese cities. You can see in the, in the classified record, LBJ stuck with those demands through the entire uh, period of the negotiations. I'm setting the timer so I tell the story quickly. Um, he didn't budge. What happened in October of 1968 is that finally the North Vietnamese budged. First they said, well, will you stop the bombing if we just agree to sit down with the South Vietnamese? I said, no, I have three demands. So then they sit and accept those three demands. And he says, by the way, the, the talks have to begin the day after I hold the bombing. And this slows things down more. And they continue arguing back and forth even after Hanoi accepts his demands um, until LBJ's hawks, people like Secretary of State Dean Ross, uh, National Security Advisor Walt Rostow, the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs, General Maxwell Taylor, um, say, they've met your conditions. We can't defend you if you don't halt the bombing. So, well, far from trying to help Hubert Humphrey, LBJ was just trying to protect his own image in history. He was trying to you know, say, I, I held the line in Vietnam. His thing was he lost the support because he stood firm on civil rights and stood firm on Vietnam. And he was worried that if he halted the bombing, uh, right before the election, and everybody would say it was political, which, no surprise, it turned out they did. Okay, second question. What would, it, what would Nixon in 1971 blackmail LBJ to do? The only thing he wanted LBJ to do at that point was to hold a press conference denouncing Nixon classified information. Well, that's the sort of thing that can help the, the Nixon administration, but not so much as to be worth the incredible risk of committing a felony <coughs> and a break um, So, really, the Nixon's order to break into Brookings and get this bombing call report doesn't make sense unless what Nixon really wanted to do was to retrieve the evidence or the intelligence that LBJ had collected during the closing days of the campaign on the Chanel Affair. Uh, most of you are familiar with the Chanel Affair, so I'll just go over it briefly. Uh, the very night that LBJ approves the bombing halt, he gets a message from Alexander Sachs, the legendary economist from Lehman Brothers, who had been the man who warned Franklin Roosevelt on behalf of Albert Einstein that the Nazis were in a position to corner the market on uranium and build an atomic bomb. And from this morning, you know, came the Manhattan Project. 
Uh, this is also a guy who predicted the rise of Hitler and uh, the, the, the Great Depression. So this guy whose, whose warnings he really took seriously. <laughs> Um, LBJ took it seriously. He went over his diplomatic intelligence. At the time, the National Security Agency was intercepting cables from the South D.C. and Washington, D.C., which is now the database I can see if anybody wants to see it. Um, and uh, you know, from the ambassador here to the government, so I got the CIA bugged South Vietnamese President Tu's office. Um, and LBJ found out that indeed they were talking about boycotting peace talks that the bombing halt would permit, would make possible, in order to keep that bombing halt from helping keep recovery, because they prefer you know, America's foremost anti-communist politician, Richard Nixon. Um, a lot of this intel is still heavily censored, but we can find out what LBJ knew because his declassified tapes are not as heavily censored. Um, and what he knew was that as Chanel the prominent uh, fundraiser for the Republican Party, Richard Nixon, was acting as sort of a go between between the Republican campaign and South Vietnamese ambassador Louis Diem. But he didn't know more than that. He only knew what she was saying, and uh, you know, about she, he knew a little bit about what Louis Diem was saying, about what Anna Schnell was saying about the Nixon campaign. So he orders the FBI to tap the South Vietnamese embassy phone, tell them everybody who walks in and walks out of the embassy to follow Anna Chenault and to tap her phone. Uh, the FBI does the first three. Does, it, does everything accept tap her phone? I really wish they did because that would make some questions a lot easier to answer. <laughs> um, but tapping the South Vietnamese embassy phone produces pay dirt on November 2nd, 1968, Saturday before the election. The FBI overhears Anna Chenault saying to Ambassador Diem um, that she has just got a message from her boss, not further identified, Hold on, we are going to win. That is the day that South Vietnamese President Chiu announces he is boycotting the peace talks. This stalls whatever kind of rise in the uh, polls that Hubert Humphrey was getting. Richard Nixon winds up winning a very close election, uh, the second closest thus far, second closest thus far in the 20th century, right behind the one he lost to JFK. Um, I should mention that during this time, LBJ called both Everett Dirksen, the Senate Minority Leader, and Nixon, and complained about this in oblique terms. I uh, didn't, you know, say specifically how he got his information, which just made it sound scary. And sometimes he pretended that he had information not only on Chanel and Dia, but on Nixon himself. So LBJ decides not to go public. Uh, I'm not going to go through all the reasons for that. I'm familiar with them. The main one is that he did not have the goods on Nixon himself. Nixon, however, does not know that. And in his first meeting with J. Edgar Hoover, the subject of his next book, after the election, um, J. Edgar Hoover comes in to uh, transition headquarters and says, during the campaign, we tapped Anna Chanel's phone, and we also put a bug on your campaign plane for the last two weeks of the campaign. He says nothing else. But J. Edgar Hoover does not know anything other than what Chanel said on the wire <coughs> Second, which is that she got a message from her boss, not other identified, not otherwise identified, um, and he said, "Hold on, we're going to win." Um, again, Nixon doesn't know that. Nixon spends most of the years of his presidency thoroughly believing that the FBI had a bug in his plane at the time. Now, it, Hoover's bluff was masterful because if Nixon was actually guilty, Nixon could not fire J. Edgar Hoover, as you all know. He did not. Um, so Nixon comes into office obsessed with getting his hands on the bombing hall for documents. One of the first things he does in January of 1969 is he tells his chief of staff, H.R. Holdman, give me a report with all the documents. Um, Holdman and Nixon both mention this in their memoirs, but they don't mention who they set to work on it. And that name means something to everybody who knows about Watergate. It's Tom Charles Houston. Tom Charles Houston, uh, the first thing he does is he does a report on the Schnell affair. He says, well, you know, LBJ doesn't look so good, but we don't look so good either. <laughs> the next thing he does seems to be exactly what Nixon wants. He says, I have found out through my sources that the Inter International Security Affairs Office of the Pentagon produced a report in the closing days of the Johnson administration on the bombing of all the documents. It was done under defense.
Defense Secretary Clark Clifford and under Assistant Secretary of Defense for ISA Paul Sumorki, you know, under great supervision of the Director of Planning, Leslie H. Gell. And these guys took the report with them, and Gell has it in a safe at the Perkins Institution. This is not so. This report doesn't exist. It seems that Houston mixed up a different report. Uh, Clifford, Orkey, Morton Halperin, who's the guy over Orkey, and Gell have all worked on a detailed report with completed documents on all the events leading up to Lyndon Johnson's partial bombing halt in March of 1968, which he announced the same night he announced he wasn't running again. That report was still classified. We all know it as the Pentagon Papers. So, flash forward. Um, 1971, Pentagon Papers leak, and Nixon doesn't care. He's like, okay, it's all about the Democrats, fine. Uh, he talks to Al Haig, he's deputy national security advisor, and, uh, and Haig says he's sure it came out of the Defense Department. Nixon goes, well, no. And Haig says, out of Clark Clifford, Warnke, Halperin, Gell, I'm sure these guys did. So Nixon immediately forms the fear that the leak of the Pentagon which wasn't about <coughs> lead to the leak of his own secrets. Now, he doesn't admit to the guys around him that he wants the bombing wall report for Anna Chenault. He wrote for the Chenault affair. That bit, you know, from Chenault's memoirs was very, very tightly held so that only people in the campaign knew about it were Nixon and Mitchell. And uh, we know it's memoirs, and people read Dean's memoirs that, you know, Nixon uh, had. Chenault and Diem to New York uh, during the summer before the camp campaign and designated uh, Chenault as his sole representative to the uh, South Vietnamese government the campaign. This is what Lyndon Johnson didn't know, and this is why Lyndon Johnson did not know that you know, it was possible I mean, that Nixon was behind the Chenault affair. Again, Nixon does not know how bad the NJP part. Uh, to, because Lyndon Johnson put a freeze on all the intelligence in October of 1968, said, no, all the CIA reports have to come to me, all the NSA reports have to come to me, all the FBI reports have to come to me. And when he left office, he took all of them with him down to his ranch in Texas. So, Nixon forms the plumbers in part to engineer the break in at Brookings to get this bombing hole report. He, the guys he hires include. G. Gordon Liddy, an FBI agent who did play like, bad jobs for the FBI, the guy who was having to do it During the Watergate hearings, all this was treated as a sideshow. Nobody found out Nixon had ordered it. John Ehrlichman was uh, questioned under oath and lied about it. He was, did you know who ordered it? But this all explains to anybody who has a question in mind why Nixon had to order the Watergate cover up. When the Watergate burglars were caught, he knew that a full investigation masterminds of that break in, which he thought would be the outcome to the plumbers, would be back to his decision to create the plumbers, which would be back to his order to break into workings to get the bombing on the report, which would be back to the Chanel affair. So the, the lesson people take from Watergate is that it's not the crime, it's the cover-up. The lesson I take from Watergate is that it's the cover-up of the earlier crime that was committed to cover up the even earlier <laughs> and Nixon committed to become president in the first place. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Ken. Uh, Kate, can you like to go next? Hi, thank you. Um, I'm going to follow up on a few points that Beverly made, um, luckily we can work together. I, one of the things that I've been focused on as a graduate student um, and now and in my work at the Senate Historical Office is thinking about uh, the role of, the historic role of congressional investigations. Um, and Watergate is always one that we point to as historians being one of these really notable investigations, both in terms of the way it played out and the public support and institutional support for the investigation over time and also some of the, some of the things that the, that the investigators found. Um, I think actually in the, in the sort of shorter story of Watergate, if we're talking about the break into the resignation or the break into the pardon, I think that the congressional investigation gets short shrift. I think we need to, typically, I mean, a, a typical 
retelling of Watergate may start with the break-in, and then it will, it'll talk about um, the Washington Post reporters, and then the Senate starts this investigation, and then during the, invest during the Senate investigation, um, we find out that there are tapes. And then the battle over the tapes sort of takes over the story. There's the Saturday Night Massacre, and then the president decides in the end that he has to resign from his part. Um, I would argue that we need to recenter that legislative executive relationship more firmly and root it more firmly in this story. Because I think that the issues that were at the heart of the Watson and Watergate investigation, things like surveillance of dissidents, um, intimidation of news reporters, um, Vietnam War policy, and uh, warrantless wiretapping, those issues, Congress had been challenging the president, and that includes administrations before Nixon, on these issues for at least a decade. So from the mid-1960s through the mid-1970s, there's actually a, a longer um, narrative that we can that we can put together that that that, that privileges the congressional investigations, and I, I think rightfully so. Um, were there political motivations for investigating Watergate? I mean, you've got you've got a Senate, a, a House and Senate that are controlled by Democrats. And Nixon, of course, is no fan of the legislative branch. So certainly there could be, we could say, yes, there were political motivations for the Senate Watergate investigation. But I think, too, that is a little unfair because the man that they chose to chair the Senate Watergate investigation, Sam Irvin, a conservative um, Democrat from North Carolina, is really important to this story. Um, Senator Mike Manfield, the the Senate Majority Leader, his decision to choose Irvin was based in part on politics. It wasn't political calculation that Senator Irvin had no aspirations for the, president, for the presidency, um, that he was an older gentleman who may not even uh, try and serve another term, um, and also, of course, that he was a conservative who had voted with Nixon about 60% of the time <laughs> on issues like law and order. Um, but even more, I think, important than that political calculation is what Senator Irvin represented in terms of protecting institutional interests. Um, starting with some of the inquiries that he does on his constitutional rights subcommittee in the Senate in the mid-1960s. And then in 1967, the Senate creates a separation of powers subcommittee, which I think is, is important to think about the way the institution is trying to give itself the, the power to challenge the presidency on some of these issues. Um, some, of the, some things like war powers, but also things more specifically like the president's use and abuse of executive privilege as a way for denying uh, Congress access to information about some of these programs that they hear about. Sam Irvin had been at the forefront of, this, of, these, of these rather small, what have been rather small investigations within the Senate on these issues. Surveillance, um, First Amendment rights, wiretap, warrantless wiretapping. He was um, an ardent proponent of First Amendment rights, but also he was very much an institutionalist. And he wanted, he was very concerned about what he saw as the, as, as Congress sort of turning over some of these powers to the president. Yes, there's a rise of the, um, as, as Arthur Schlesinger said, the imperial presidency, and, and Senator Irvin was very conscious of that. But he also saw that Congress had a role to play in turning some of those powers over to the president. And he was very, um, he was very interested and invested in figuring out how Congress could take some of those powers back. And I think that is important um, in our telling of the story, that Senator Irvin wasn't just politically a safe choice. He was also institutionally the best guy for the job. I think, too, that we should spend more time thinking about the Senate investigation because, as David mentioned and, and we all have, have talked about here, that's the way that most Americans came to understand Watergate. Watergate could have very well been an inside the Beltway story. The Washington Post reporters, as good as they were, were still not read by a majority of Americans. It was through the Senate Watergate hearings that I think it's something like 98% of Americans came in a, in a Gallup poll to say, yes, I know what Watergate is, I know about, I know what this, I know what this topic is. That's
that's remarkable and really important to the story and something I think that's more deserving of just a, a couple of paragraphs or maybe even a chapter in a very large book about Watergate. Um, just uh, to be brief, because I don't have a lot of time, one, one of the issues that Sam Irvin had been very, um, had been following doggedly was the issue of executive privilege. And he had his staff on the separation of, of powers subcommittee look into, sort of provide me a historical analysis of how presidents have used executive privilege, the term, but also like the concept in, in terms of denying information to um, members of Congress and their staff. And of course, it goes all the way back to the early days of the Republic. I mean, George Washington tried to deny access, uh, tried to deny um, a House uh, Special Investigatory Committee access to information about a failed military campaign in 1792. The, the legislative and executive branches have been battling over access to information for a long time. But what Irvin <coughs> wanted to know was the way that President Nixon, in particular, used executive privilege specifically as a way to say one of two things. Either I won't give you the information because it will endanger national security, or two, I won't give you the information because it's part of my privileged conversation in the White House. I need to have these sort of frank and open conversations with my staff. Um, what Senator Urban's staff found is that that had really um, become a, a, a modern 20th century model um, in 1954 when um, President Eisenhower used executive privilege to deny access to um, Senator Joe McCarthy in the Army um, McCarthy hearings. And so uh, over time, it, Irvin sees, you know, Kennedy says, I'll use executive privilege sparingly. I mean, what's interesting is that through the, through the documents, you can actually see the president, um, the committee staff writing to the office of the president of the legal counsel and saying, how are you going to use executive privilege? This is how it's been used in the past. And each president saying, this is what I'll do. Kennedy says, I won't use it very often. I won't use it for my staff at all. Um, Johnson says, I'm going to follow the Kennedy model, which he does, sort of. Um, and then Nixon just says, I'm, I mean, he just does. He just uses it however he wants to. <laughs> and that is what, that is what really, really, um, that is in part why Urban sees that this process has to end. Nixon abuses it in a way that others hadn't, um, but, but the process was did predate the Nixon administration. So anyway, over this particular issue of executive privilege, Senator Irvin presides over literally hundreds of hours of hearings related to this specific issue. And then he publishes reports, and he's trying to, I've, I've interviewed a couple of his staff, and what he was trying to do is he was trying to educate his colleagues. We've got this serious problem. We have presidents that are using and abusing just this one, just this one phrase, executive privilege, as a way to deny us information. And um, so he's, he's sort of pounding away at this, and then, and then Watergate comes onto the scene. And so, in some way, it's 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 the perfect opportunity for institutionally minded people like Senator Urban to say. Look at what happens when Congress doesn't do its job. And we can't do our job in part because presidents are denying us access to the information we need to make, um, to, to provide and exercise oversight, which is one of the things that Congress is supposed to play. Um, so, of course, if you, uh, one of the things that I've been able to do recently is, is watch some of the Watergate hearings, and I encourage any of you who have hundreds of hours to go ahead and do that together. <laughs> there are some really funny moments, and if you can get yourself a tape that actually has the commercials still embedded within it, oh my gosh, they're so funny. But um, what, I, what I've noticed about the Senate Watergate hearings is that I, I think that we've done a disservice in not incorporating more of that material into our research into Watergate, because if you listen to the members, talking to folks like Daniel Shore out in the hallways of the Senate office building, the Senate Russell office building, they're not, they, their end game is not that the president's going to resign. They don't know that's going to happen. They don't, most of them wouldn't even dream of that. There's this perfect interview between Daniel Shore and, um, and Senator Howard Baker, the vice chairman of the committee, a Republican. And he says, this is right after Dean's testimony, it was seven or 11 hours, whatever it was, of testimony. And Shore says to him, so what's going to happen? I mean, Dean's saying one thing. Presumably, the president would disagree with his interpretation of events. And Howard Baker says, this really comes down to access. 
we need to get the information. If the president isn't going to come down here himself, then he's going to have to provide us with the documents that we've requested to get to the bottom of this. So I, I think that this gets back to my earlier point about this, the use of executive privilege, that, that for many members on the Watergate Committee and the members of Congress who would presumably at some point be voting on articles of impeachment, these are the issues that they were thinking about. They weren't envisioning that the president may resign. They were thinking about these real institutional, like they were loggerheads really over some of these issues. And Watergate created this unique opportunity for them to publicly address and draw a lot of draw a lot of public attention to these things that they've been looking into. Um, interestingly, though, is that the, while the Watergate Committee enjoyed very high approval ratings throughout its public phase, which is about seven or eight months, I think, um, people found that they, the senators seemed to approach it, but they, they weren't very partisan in their approach. They seemed to really like the facts. Gallup poll after poll showed that Americans were behind the Senate Watergate Committee. At the same time, um, and, and this may be something that Mark gets to a little bit, Washington Post, um, so there's some Washington Post journalists, um, Broder and a few others, who are publishing statistics about um, the approval, overall approval ratings from, for Congress and the White House in early 1974. And in spite of the fact that people think that Wat the Watergate Committee is doing a good job, Congress has the same approval rating that the White House does. And so there's a, there is something, in it, and specifically what they tell Broder and, and his colleagues are that, that, the, that this, the, this institutional battle that's playing out is a distraction from what they consider to be the real issues. Skyrocketing inflation, energy, uh, energy costs, and, uh, and persistent And so it's very, I think that one of, one of the things perhaps that the government doesn't do well is, is educate the American public about why these issues are important, why this institutional battle is important to these larger policy issues that they would like to see the, the, the President and Congress work out. Um, to, to leave just with a couple points, I think that um, there are a few areas here that are really right for further investigation. Um, in particular, I think we need to take a look at, at how Watergate plays out, to this, this battle between the executive and legislative branches. I think we need to look more at how it plays out after Watergate. Um, one thing that I, that I noticed in just putting together some, some notes for this talk is that um, while we can consider the Watergate period as a sort of resurgent Congress, um, led by, in part by some of these institutionalists like Urban, and I mentioned a couple of House members in my book, um, they were resurgent and they and they did gain back some of these powers during the Ford and Carter administrations. In part because those were two presidents who I think were institutionally more weak <laughs> um, than than their predecessors. But also one thing I noticed is that in the 76, 78, and 1980 elections, the turnover in the Senate, for example, is remarkable. Um, 56 new members in that six-year period. 56 freshmen are serving their first term in the Senate. A lot of those institutional, institutionally-minded members that I mentioned are gone. Senator Irvin retires. There are a couple of others who lose in their primaries or they lose against um, their challengers. And the big gains come um, in the Republican Party, of course. In all three of those cycles, the Republicans gain more seats in the Senate than, than, than their so I think we need to think about, and then of course, um, with when, when Ronald Reagan um, takes the oath in 1981, it's a very different, it's a very different political landscape. And so you have a Senate that's for the first time in more than 30 years controlled by Republicans. We have to think about um, how that battle, the, that institutional struggle that that is so um, that plays out so front and center in the Watergate, Senate Watergate investigation, how that then plays out with a different political. So I'll leave it there and hope that we can talk a little bit about what's going to work on. Thanks. Thank you, Kate. Remark, then. Thank you, Dave. Um, this may sound
sound strange to say, but I, I think the, um, it may sound, sound strange to say this about one really of the greatest political scandal in American history, but I think the scholarship on Watergate has not paid enough, enough attention to the actual politics. Uh, politics in the nation in 1974 especially. Uh, I think perhaps scholars implicitly or explicitly uh, in their work on congressional committees, uh, on the role of the press, has tried to kind of undermine Nixon's you know, view of Watergate, that it was basically a you know, partisan witch hunt uh, undertaken by liberal Democrats and liberal members of the press to drive him from office. And I think they've kind of bent backwards in their scholarship to show that, no, in fact, you know, uh, Woodward and Bernstein, as David shows in his book, were actually very professional in the way they went about investigating um, you know, Watergate break-in, and that you know, congressional Democrats as Kate was talking about, uh, were concerned about serious constitutional issues when they were investigating Watergate. But it clearly wasn't just a political uh, hatchet job on Nixon. But, but I think the focus uh, on the investigations, on the role of the press, has kind of taken our eye away from what a great political um, controversy it was. Not only in the sense that you know, Democrats saw it as an opportunity to get at Nixon, but I think uh, Republicans as well uh, looked at the scandal uh, in terms of its political ramifications for the party. Uh, in my work on public opinion polling, uh, I've looked a lot at the way the Republicans responded to the polls that came out of Watergate in 1973 and 1974, especially polls that showed that Republicans were being killed in the midterm elections in November. Uh, and I think that really had an impact on the way they approached the Watergate uh, affair. Um, it, I think it forced them to put more pressure on the president to be more forthcoming. Uh, they kept reading polls, uh, you know, saying that, I think by the end of 1973, Gallup and Harris polls predicted that Democrats, Republicans would lose about 10 points uh, in the coming November elections. And they were predicting you know, one of the greatest landslides uh, in political history. And from party stalwarts like you know, Goldwater, uh, Norton Vita Rhodes, um, and others, you know, this was a serious problem. And I know for Goldwater, for much of the time, he didn't believe Nixon was implicated in Margate and kept prodding him to you know, reveal more, you know, give them the tapes, you know, give them what they want. Uh, because he was afraid that he kept dragging on that Watergate was going to tear down the party. Uh, I just have one uh, interesting letter that I'd like to read for you. Uh, Goldwater was really the first one to bring this issue to the first prominent Republican uh, to talk about the polls openly. Uh, other Republicans, uh, Bush who ran the Republican National Committee at the time, denied that Watergate was going to affect local congressional elections. You know, there was a, a creep, uh, you know, uh, it was something that affected the creep. It was not the party that had undertaken uh, this break-in. Uh, and others in the party had basically you know, talked about the same line. Well, Goldwater got his hands on a private poll in early 1974 that showed, it was an 11-state poll, showing that you know, Republicans were basically going to lose 10 points below where they were in the previous election uh, as a result of Watergate, <clears throat> and he publicized this. And I think one of the reasons he did this is because, again, he was trying to prod Nixon. Look, you know, look what this is doing to the party. You need to do what you you know, have to do to make this go away by November. Uh, and after he did this, uh, Harry Dent, who of course had been a Nixon political strategist, uh, at the time was a general counsel for the GOP, wrote Goldwater a letter. And the goal of the letter uh, reads in part, uh, I am one of your admirers, uh, began Dan, but honestly, I just don't understand why you say some of the things you do. <laughs> to say that all Republican politicians will suffer a 10% loss is wrong and damaging as hell to our recruiting efforts. Okay. Well, Goldwater, in his response, offers an equally frank uh, assessment. He told Dan, quote, you are like most of my Republican brothers. You just want to see the beautiful glow of a raising sun, but I am not built that way. 
Lord Lord went on to say that debt, uh, to debt that the pole was not his, that it was given to him by somebody else, and that things might get better. But he ended the letter by saying, at this point, Water gave him the presidential decisions and mistakes to do nothing but hurt incumbent Republicans. And Goldwater went on to assure Dent that if he thought that, quote, one minute I'm going to hide the dirty, bloody truth, and have another thing coming. Uh, and Goldwater continued uh, to talk about this openly, to talk about how much Watergate was harming uh, congressional Democrats. Uh, and of course, his position was backed up then in early uh, spring of 1974 when there were a string of special elections held uh, for seats that had been vacated. There were six of them. They'd all been seats that had been vacated by Republicans. Uh, one of them was actually uh, Gerald Ford's seat, which was vacated when he became vice president. His seat had been held by a Republican since 1910. And in the special election, uh, the Democrat won. Uh, and after that election, uh, the Republican National Committee started finally worrying about Watergate. And they hired uh, Nixon's bolster, a guy Robert Teeter, to conduct a post-election study in this Michigan district to find out what was going on. And what Teeter found was that 73% of the people who voted um, talked about Watergate as being the most important issue. And something that the Democrat had pounded um, the, the Republican opponent throughout the contest. Um, and they ran these kind of post-election studies and other congressional elections as well. And again, they all confirmed basically what Goldwater had been saying and what others in the party had been denying that you know, Watergate was having this tremendous negative impact on the party. Um, I think there were other ways in which polls really kind of played a role in Watergate in terms of how the uh, scandal was revealed and then how it was finally uh, satisfied. But I think for you know, Goldwater and other Republicans, uh, this was really an important consideration. Uh, if you read their memoirs and read, I think, the existing literature on Watergate, you don't get the sense that there was any elections going on that year. Um, I think Michael Schutz in his book calls this focus on like, constitutional issues conspicuous devotion to the Constitution. You get the sense that that's all that was going on. Uh, you know, these wise men thinking these deep thoughts about these deep constitutional principles. And I don't deny that that was an important consideration, but I also think that uh, politics had a lot to do with the uh, political fortunes of the Republican Party in 1974, I think helped to push Republicans to push the president uh, into being more forthcoming in the end, and helped to bring about his own, his own demands. So I really think that uh, looking at polls, but also simply looking at the role of Republicans in the Watergate uh, scandal, I think, is a, is a field right for study. I don't know of any monograph that looks specifically at Republicans in Watergate, uh, but I think they had a you know, big role to play in the way the, uh, the scandal finally went down. Thank you. Great. Thank, thank you, Mark. Uh, so uh, I'm going to uh, say a few words about Nixon and sort of his historical reputation, which is something that I wrote about uh, 10 years ago now, and looking at the changes in Nixon's reputation sort of in the last 10 years, and it seems to me that Watergate, uh, and this is somewhat uh, in, in uh, conflict with Bev's proposition, although I, I think they could be sort of reconciled, it seems to me that Watergate actually looms larger in our understanding of Nixon than it did 10 years ago. You know, in the 1980s, there was a strong effort by Nixon and people around him to emphasize his foreign policy achievements, the opening to China in particular, but also detente, uh, and to sort of try to hold up what Nixon was even trying to say in 1974, that this should be Nixon's true legacy. And then in the 1990s, a number of historians uh, and journalists acting as historians began looking at Nixon's domestic policy record and somewhat influenced by the more conservative uh, Reagan and post-Reagan climate began to look at Nixon's domestic legacy as more liberal and as more activist and as more accomplished than he had previously been given credit for. And so these, these new Nixons seemed, at least in some tellings, to perhaps um, threat to supplant that older enduring image of Tricky Dick that had come down to us uh, and been kind of 
uh, burned in acid with Watergate. Um, but it seems to me that that's really changed. Uh, and we've gone back to a position where the primary understandings of Nixon do now center on Watergate. And, and I think that's right. Watergate hasn't been fully integrated into narratives of the 70s and interpretations and analyses of the 70s. And we might talk some as a panel here about how, how the under, those understandings might be integrated. But it seems that kind of only now we're getting kind of reacquainted with that real Nixon. Not because we're escaping the past, but because in a way we're rediscovering it. And, you know, thinking about a recent play uh, and movie of, about Nixon that, you know, this, this, these uh, kind of layers of ice kind of you know, came to encase Nixon after uh, Watergate with this foreign policy and domestic stuff. And, and now we're starting to defrost Nixon. And so we can see Nixon kind of re, re You know, if you look at where, where the Gallup polls just say, you know, do you approve or disapprove of this presidency, whatever that really means, being asked 40 years later, you know, he's back down to only 28% approval, 65% disapproval. Uh, you know, numbers close to where they were in 1974. So all that hard work he did for rehabilitation, <laughs> you know, for naught. Um, and I think there are several things that have led to this. One, perhaps the most important is the tapes, uh, you know, as, as Ken could probably speak to better than any of us, that to the extent that historians are using them as sources, and they're still not using them enough, um, they are, are telling a story that sort of reinforces a lot of kind of people's worst, <laughs> worst uh, impressions of Nixon in some ways. Nixon comes out even worse now than, than he did uh, before. Uh, but I think it also, you know, as we all know, interpretations of history change with the times that we live in. And I think in some ways both the Clinton impeachment and, and, and then the Bush presidency helped revive those older uh, and I think enduring uh, images of, of Nixon. The Clinton impeachment was really both sides, sort of Clinton's defenders and his uh, antagonists, pointed to Watergate. The Republicans in saying nobody is above the law and using those mantras from Watergate to try to hold Clinton, put him in sort of the same box as Nixon. Um, but then Clinton's defenders turned that around and said, okay, let's, let's talk about Watergate. Here's the difference in the crimes and here's the difference in what these men did. And, and public opinion really seemed to finally reject that comparison that these were comparable and reject Nixon's old excuse, everybody does it. That no, you know, whatever one thought of, of, of Clinton's uh, deceptions about the Lewinsky affair, this did not rise to the level of impeachment as, as the refrain of that uh, crisis had. So in that sense, it kind of reaffirmed Watergate as the benchmark, as the standard uh, of, of, of presidential wrongdoing um, in a way that, for example, Iran-Contra, you know, which was quite great, of course, in, in its own terms, you know, has not, has not stood the test of time to us as, 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 as bearing that weight. The Bush presidency, in, in a way, I think revived these uh, images of Nixon not through dissimilarity, but through similarity. Um, I mean, people sometimes joke, oh, you know, they were nostalgic for Nixon in the Bush uh, years. But in truth, I think they saw parallels. There were uh, a new effort to reass reassert an imperial presidency. Uh, Bush and Nixon both saw very few legitimate limits on executive power. Uh, they both kind of donned the mantle of war president you know, as if they were Churchill with the bombs falling, um, to silence and intimidate even critics of an unpopular military adventure. Uh, they both sort of were secretive in the extreme and isolated from the media. Um, both presented the cultural or, or supposed imputed cultural dominance of liberals and the media and the intelligentsia and so on, and sort of worked in a vein of conservative populism. So there were all these kind of echoes of the Nixon style and sensibility and ideology in the Bush years. And I would argue that that's not a coincidence. 
but that's an inheritance. In fact, many of Bush's people sort of came out of the Nixon uh, period. I mean, Carl Grove might be the best example. He ran the Commons Republicans during Watergate. Uh, you know, he was even investigated uh, for some of the dirty tricks that he was involved in. And, you know, uh, as John Dean said, well, they decided, the investigators decided they had bigger fish to fry. Um, but there's a great video you can find on YouTube of Dan Rather in 1972 interviewing Carl Rove about his strategy for, for getting young people to vote for Nixon and uh, Rather maybe passing reference to a document shredder in the corner of the room. Um, and, and so these are, you know, Chuck Colson was brought back by Bush to do the faith-based program. Rumsfeld and, and, and Cheney, of course, um, Nixon administration veterans, all they weren't in the inner circle in quite the same way. But I think there's a fairly direct line connecting those two White Houses, and a lot of the political sensibility and thinking of the Bush years was shaped by Nixon. And so to come back to Frost Nixon, I remember when I saw the play on Broadway, uh, the line that got the biggest laugh even though it's a very serious line, was perhaps the most famous line from those interviews that David Frost conducted with Nixon after his presidency, when Nixon says, when the president does it, that means it's not illegal. And it was just clear, you could tell from the laughter itself, that people were thinking about comments by Bush and Cheney and the unitary executive and you know, statements that uh, the president is always right in these affairs. And there was kind of a real revival of this Thinking. And in fact, you know, Cheney has, has said on the record that he believed after the rain union of that state, as, as he calls it in her book, after the efforts to rein in the imperial presidency by Congress and by civil society, Congress, uh, the presidency needed to reassert its power. And so this was in the minority report of Irish Contra that David Addington, Cheney's aide, uh, was instrumental in writing. And Again, it resurfaced in, in, in Cheney and, and Bush um, in, in the Bush years. So, so there's a real kind of legacy, and I think people understood this, and that the Bush presidency, in a way, revived and helped us see with new clarity a lot of um, uh, what uh, people had rightly been appalled by uh, in, in the Watergate years. And I think deep down, Nixon knew that he ultimately, for all these efforts to Burnish his image and change the topic, that he knew this was never really going to take. And in 1990, he published one of his many post presidential memoirs, not the big one, RN, but one of these uh, subsequent ones. And he, uh, you know, had conversations about it with Monica Crowley, his research assistant, who then, in true Nixonian fashion, secretly recorded. Uh, everything Nixon said and published it. Um, I mean, she didn't record it with, with the tape recorder, but she wrote, took notes. And uh, she uh, wrote about Nixon being very discouraged when this book, whose title escapes me, I've written down, but published around 1990, came out. And he had all this stuff about Russia and China in there, and none of the press coverage was interested in it. And he says, Nixon says to Monica Crowley, none of the other stuff in there, like on the Russians and the other personal stuff, made it into the news or even the book reviews. He despaired. Waterbeat. That's all anybody wants. And I think, in a way, as Nixon recedes into history and you know, as he gets, as all presidents do over time, fewer words in you know, a textbook or a chapter or a short summary, um, that Watergate is the part that you can't leave out uh, of the Nixon presidency. And, and if people, if students know one thing about him, that is what it's going to be. And we can enrich that understanding, and we can complicate it, we can ask any questions as well we should, but I don't think we're going to be getting away from it, uh, at least as far as Richard Nixon is concerned.